Right. So uh, we're just going to go through some lathe training. Uh, I apologize if for you guys this is repeating a fair bit because we obviously have the advantage of Alan here all the time for most of our training. Um, but I just want to start off with some basic stuff about the lathe itself. Uh, they'll vary pretty heavily between unit to unit, but the actual basis of them is all pretty straightforward. Uh, so some general anatomy from back to front. Uh, you have the hand wheel for operating the tail stock. You have the tail stock itself with its spindle. Well, everything is mounted to its bed. You have your tool rest and banjo, headstock, and headstock spindle. Uh, on this fella in particular, it is a variable speed, so you do have a control panel at the front here. Um, but otherwise, headstock, bed, tailstock, banjo, the tool rest is going to be your main uh, points of importance. Uh, this one's set up on a variable height stand specifically, though most lathes aren't going to come with it unless they're a floor standing machine. Uh, you have a few different kinds of drive types for them and what drives the spindle, selects your speed and whatnot. Um, you start off with belt only lathes. Those are going to be um, your WL-B440H. They only use a drive belt and stepped pulleys to adjust your speed. So for adjusting them, you'd be opening up your panels and shifting your belt up and down uh, to change speeds. From there, you go to what I sort of call a variable belt lathe. Uh, those are your WL900H and your WL1100P. Those fellas have uh, a single belt and a single pair of pulleys, but they have like a gear lever at the front uh, with 10 positions that actually expands and contracts the spacing between the pulleys, which changes the, the radius to adjusting your speed. Uh, and then you've got fellas like these. These are uh, electric variable speed. There's a couple different ways that achieve this uh, within our range, um, but for the most part, it's variable frequency drive, uh, which means that as you up your motor speed, uh, you're also increasing torque. There is one or two in the range that as you increase speed, it's just upping the voltage to the motor, which you do lose a little bit of torque at higher speeds. Um, and in those ones, we've upped motor sizes to, to sort of accommodate that. Um, there, these sorts of fellas are good for achieving results across, like good results across some various kinds of turning because you do have such quick access to, to changing speeds. Uh, a lot of people sort of fall prey to on uh, your belt change lathes and whatnot, not changing speeds when they should do uh, because it just takes some time to stop, detention the motor, change your belts and whatnot. Um, so these tend to be best for people who are doing lots of different things. If you're just, for example, doing pens, you can sort of leave it all at one speed and, and be generally fine. Um, for when to change speeds, uh, rule of thumb is as your diameter increases, the lower your speed should be. That's partly because of the, the weight can be quite excessive and spinning that at really high speeds just isn't necessary and can be quite dangerous. Um, from the other side as well, as you increase in diameter, that outer diameter is moving faster, so you don't have to accommodate for as much by upping the speed of the lathe. You can turn it down and the outside's still moving quite quickly. Smaller things, you want to increase your speed because you're not getting compensated for as much with the, the size of the material. Um, we do have in uh, Jeremy's fantastic new lathe manuals, there is a little table in there uh, that does recommend vaguely some uh, RPMs for various size pieces. Um, they're in the four most recent, four most recent um, lathe releases. There's also this, which will be up on the on the shared drive. I've also added that table on here as well uh, for, for reference. Um, you have a couple of different types of turning pieces that can be turned on your lathes. They're mainly broken down into two categories, which are your bulb lengths. Bulb lengths are taken from the tree, if you can sort of imagine the tree standing like that. So your grain is actually running along here. Uh, this means that your grain is running at a right angle to your bed, and that requires a certain type of tools uh, to turn. Your other option is a spindle. This is taken from the tree in the same direction like that, but when it means it's running along. And there are just sort of different types of tools that uh, I'll cover in a moment for adjusting to that kind of different grain, grain direction. Uh, because that does have a very different effect when it's spinning at, say, a 15, 1700 RPM, 
it's going to affect your tools differently. You need to adjust your tools to, to accommodate them. Uh, for mounting your bulb lengths, you have a few options. The most traditional ones can be a faceplate. So this threads straight onto the spindle and you have your bulb length screwed to it by centering, marking and screwing the faceplate to the bulb. This is going to be probably best for larger bulbs. I'd say anything over 150 mil, sort of six inch diameter, is going to be best suited for it. Any smaller, and it's a lot of hassle to set them up for fairly limited results. Every one of our lathes comes with a faceplate off the bat, so it is usually the most accessible just in that it's always included. Uh, the other option would be a woodworm screw. So this little fella comes in all of our chucks, so both the SN2 and the G3 uh, Nova chucks. These ones simply wind into an eight millimeter hole. So you mark center with something like this sort of fella here. Finding the center of your blank, drilling an eight mil hole. You can go about an inch deep, so about 20, 25 mils fine. And this just winds into the back of the bulb link and gets held in your chuck jaws. Uh, this tends to be my preference for most things over a faceplate because you're much easier to find one center point and drill one hole as opposed to finding that center point, finding a circle around that and marking out several screw holes for a faceplate. Just a lot quicker and as you wind it into your chuck as well, the surface of the jaws here are going to pull it nice and square so you're also not having to worry about alignment uh, as much out the gate with them. As for your spindles, mounting spindles is a bit more uh, straightforward. There are things like steady rests and whatnot for longer spindles, uh, where your headstock and tailstock aren't going to support it the full length. You know, for if you're doing canes or, or bed legs or things like that, you know, table legs that are going to be coming out to here on an extension table, you may want to have some sort of bearing uh, guide in here to hold the center, just so you don't get any eccentric wobbles and whatnot. But otherwise, Start with your drive center. Your drive center has a spur in the middle and then these four tines around the outside. Once you mark center, so again using something like these to, to mark the center of your spindle, this one's located on the top and is tapped into place with a mallet. That now bites onto and is what drives the, uh, the material and that's mounted in the head sock. And then for the tail stock on the other end you have what's called a live center. So again, mark the center of the back of your material. This one you can kind of press in. It doesn't have to be heavily mounted, but just a light couple wraps from the back of the metal. And that's going to be enough indentation to tell it where it needs to go. And that fella can flip into the back of your tail screw. It's all Morse tapered too. So everything across all of our legs is universal in terms of uh, yeah, live and drive centers. Everything's Morse tapered too. We do sell some Morse Taper ones, though the, the kinds of lathes that they're for haven't really been prominent um, for a long, long time. That was back when you had your little, you know, they'd be a foot wide and a foot across kind of uh, little aluminium frame setups that people just don't do anymore. This one, I've now got my indentation, so I can mount the, the tail stock at the back there, bring it forward until those tines lock into place here. And with a locking lever at the back, the tailstock is then locked into place. We can loosen off here and using the hand wheel, you can wind that live center into the back and lock it off here. And that's now applying tension. So that's holding this in place. You can give it a bit of a, a push just to make sure it's not moving. And that now is going to stay nice and central while we're turning. For these sorts of spindles, um, really this is going to be the only way you need to ever mount them. There'll be some special cases where you've got to use some special kinds of jaws and things like that on the chuck for holding them. So for example, um, pens and whatnot, you'll need pen or pin jaws that go in here for holding square pen blanks. Um, but those are sort of more extreme, uh, more extreme cases for the common like candlesticks and um, salt and pepper mills and things like that that people are doing. Yeah, live and drive center is going to be all than sufficient for the potential of that. Um, I do have a table of troubleshooting things uh, on here as well that will be available on the drive. Uh, they're also in those, those four new manuals. I highly recommend looking through it. It's going to be very useful for you guys for diagnosing problems. Not that there are many for these outside of 
general user error, whether you're using the wrong tool, going the wrong speed, mounting it incorrectly, that kind of thing is what you'll most commonly come across. Uh, but it is a good resource in that it does have uh, like a, a symptom, a cause, and a, a likely cause, and then potential solution. So it is a good piece of information for, for getting to your customers with. Uh, but that is the general summary of the, of the layers in their general function.